here it comes. El Nino is building. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, October 1st. Storm Surf. Waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. You can see the Storm Surf icon down in the lower right hand side of your screen. Just click that and you can subscribe. You'll get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. And if you want to donate a little bit of money to the cause, you can hit the special thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it, and make a small contribution. And with that, I'd like to thank the folks that contributed last week. We have Coach Nate, of course, as always. Elliot Harris, yes. Pre-Plan 1, Emilio, uh, Kim, uh, Tim Caston, and Kim in California. Thank you all so much for your contributions. We really appreciate it. In regards to the title of the video, yes, El Nino is building. You can see it in the atmosphere. The ocean and the atmosphere are getting coupled. We see direct evidence of it now. It's not just a forecast. And over the next 45 plus minutes, we're going to go into all the details of what's happening and what you can expect over the coming months as El Nino gets a stronger grip on our forecast and hopefully starts improving surf and potentially bringing rainfall and snow into California. So let's do it. We're going to start by looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean. We see remnants of a gale in the Gulf of Alaska. Yes, there was a gale, and it has produced some seas, and it has produced some swell. We'll get into that in a minute. We also see the beginnings of potentially another gale over the dateline, and then some tropical activity in the far west Pacific. So, the North Pacific is becoming active. Let's take a quick look at current conditions. We'll start in Northern California, the Point Reyes buoy number 029. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy all the way up from 33.3 uh, second period, super long period energy, which there is none, all the way down to five second period, just pure chop. We see a bump of Looks like wind swell here in about the 9 to maybe 10 second range, something like that. Take all the area under the curve, put it together. Primary swell, 7.2 feet at 10.1 seconds from 314 degrees. That's surf theoretically at 7.3 feet, but waves are probably in the head high range, maybe a little bit more at top spots in Northern California. And then sort of lumped in with that is wind swell, even lesser period, 5.3 feet at 6.9 seconds again from 317 degrees. Also of note, the Half Moon Bay buoy off of Mavericks is gone forever, it appears. NOAA has decided to put some sort of a new buoy in, a, uh, a basically like a drone buoy that sits in place. I mean, it does measure significant wave heights, water temperature, wind speeds, but it doesn't have the spectral data, so you can't go and produce a graph like this and go tease out what the primary swell is. So in reality, in my opinion, this is a step like going back 30 or 40 years, but uh, apparently anchoring that buoy on the seafloor there. There's some uh, delicate coral reefs under there. They're tired of getting the, the reef all ripped up as they have to anchor that buoy in, into the ocean floor, so they're trying some new technology. Uh, the downside of this is, well, the only other buoy is 46026 off San Francisco, which always reads really low and is not really a good indicator. And then you have the, the Monterey buoy, 46042, further south that's kind of past the Mavericks point. And then you have the Point Reyes buoy up there off of Point Reyes, but it tends to get beat pretty bad. It's a much smaller buoy, and in a really strong winter storm, it can be gone. Also of note, buoy 4606, 600 miles out, is down. Buoy 4605, way off the Pacific Northwest, it's down. Buoy 46002 off of Oregon, it's down. So we're really in a, uh, a sort of a blind, nearly a blind spot here now, and the maintenance trips for a lot of these buoys aren't scheduled till sometime next year, which basically is worthless in terms of trying to monitor what's going on this El Nino winter. So we're in a bit of a pickle, but there's not a lot we can do about make the best of what we got. 
Going to Southern California, the Point Loma South buoy 191, same deal looking at all the energy there. Mainly it's wind swell, much filtered by the Channel Islands. You see bits of energy in the 13, 14 second range, the whole way down to 5 seconds. Primary swell 1.9 feet at 12.1 seconds from 185 degrees, so a little bit of background southern hemi swell. That puts surf at about 2.5 feet, and I think I saw waves down south in the you know, waist to chest high range this morning sort of thing. And then secondary wind swell, 1.8 feet at 8.9 seconds from more or less the west, 254 degrees, and that's pretty small surf. Then we go over to the north shore of Oahu, Waimea Bay, number 106. Again, pretty quiet there. A little bump of energy starting to show. Uh, this is new swell, sideband swell from that gale we're going to talk about that traversed over the Dateline region a couple of days ago. And then a little bit of wind swell mixed in. Primary swell, there's the wind swell, 2.3 feet at 8 seconds from 36 degrees. Um, not sure on that degree, but just wind swell there at two feet. And then the secondary swell, one foot at 15.8 seconds from 329 degrees. That's the new swell coming in, but pretty small. So let's rewind to Thursday, the 28th of September. A gale started to develop on the dateline right there. There's a little plus sign right in the middle of it. Uh, max significant wave height, 18.5 feet, adding the coordinates there, 40.5 north, 179.25 east right there. Anyway, you can see it quickly blew up as we got into Thursday evening with seas up to 35 feet. And then on Friday morning, again, 35-foot seas, slowly pushing off to the east while moderating. Still 30-foot seas, or 32 feet, theoretically, as we got into Saturday morning, and then fading from there. Swell, small sideband swell, that's the swell. In fact, maybe we can, now you can't, whoops, you can't really see it here. But the leading edge of that is just now pushing into the Hawaiian Islands and bound for the Pacific Northwest down in California. A new system, you can see it developing here. We'll get into that in a minute. All right, so what's coming? We're looking at jet stream level winds. These winds are up about 30,000 feet to help support the formation of gales when those gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet, which we see right here. That helps create a uh, counterclockwise eddy in the upper atmosphere and down at the ocean surface. That is the hallmark of low pressure. And of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds, if they're strong enough, get traction on the ocean surface and generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, eventually turn into swell as they get groomed out. And of course, swell and hit your beach turns into surf. So we have some potential here over the Dateline region. Now, also note, the model is... 12, almost 18 hours old. This is not an issue with storm surf. Um, I've written to NOAA. We get all the raw data from NOAA. They got the supercomputers that run all this stuff. Um, they're having some difficulties with their data feed. It's been doing this, if, if you've noticed, it's been on and off since I think Wednesday of last week. So hopefully they'll figure it out and enough people that, uh, you know, have access to this publicly available information, I'm sure we'll be right them and come Monday they'll start working on it. Anyway, so we're using a little bit old data, but it's fairly representative. On Sunday, uh, that's today, the trough continues to dig out, and by Monday we have a reasonably good trough here with 150, maybe even 160 knot winds pushing down into the trough. That should get the uh, upper level low pressure going and down at the surface. Now the trough gets a little bit pinched out as we get Tuesday into Wednesday, but it is due north of Hawaii. All the energy aimed south in the upper atmosphere, likely that will manifest in the low itself as north winds, and that will drive some swell towards Hawaii. They need their shot. California's had some raw swell, actually two of them now. It's Hawaii's turn, and that seems like a very likely possibility. Also notice here, a big ridge building over uh, the Gulf of Alaska as we get into Wednesday. That'll probably set up some degree of north winds, maybe in northern California. We'll, we'll check that out. Now notice the jet remains consolidated as we get into Thursday, but splits here in the uh, 
in the Eastern Pacific. This is pretty typical. So actually, the jet looks amazingly good for this time of year. Considering that we've been in La Nina for multiple years, we think perhaps a little bit of the El Nino influence is starting to manifest, along with just a seasonal change. Anyway, as we get into Friday, jet looking pretty solid. One, two, three. That's 160 knot winds pushing over the date line, building a new, theoretically newly developing trough on Saturday in the Gulf of Alaska. Now, again, this is an older model. I think it's not, the, the trough is in reality not as defined as what this model is suggesting if you had access to the newer data, you'd see. But still, the pattern looking very good, not a split jet, fairly energetic, looking supportive of gale development. We're just waiting for that little push more to push to get us over the edge. Next up, surface level pressure, surface level winds. Here is the gale developing over the date line, building as we get into Sunday night with 40 knot north winds forecast, almost 45, even a little tiny pinch of 50 knot winds. And I think the model has backed off a little bit, and you'll see it here when we get into the wave model. But still, some likely generating seas. Hawaii's right there, aim pretty much due north at Hawaii. A little bit of fetch at the U.S. West Coast, but not a whole lot expected from that. By uh, Monday night, winds down to 40 knots from the north. And then as we get into Tuesday morning, still some 40 knot north winds. The gale not moving a whole lot, sitting fairly stationary. This is good for Hawaii in that you could end up with a multiple day little swell out of that thing. And then finally, as we get into Wednesday, it all peters out. Now, theoretically, you see big low pressure developing over here in the uh, off uh, the southern Kuril Islands in Japan into Saturday, but then sort of moderating. Now, again, old data here. Previously, it suggested some sort of a deep low developing here in the Gulf. Latest runs not suggesting that. Tropical systems forecast, but again, they're, they're way out. You can't believe the GFS model is certainly with tropical systems this far into the future, but at least there is some hope. So what is the effect of those winds on the ocean surface? Well, here's our gale, and this is the 18Z run of the model. 20-foot seas forecast by tonight, even uh, 20, 22 feet maybe for a little area aimed at Hawaii. As we get into Monday morning, 23-foot seas aimed at Hawaii. Again, 23-foot seas, and that is, let's see, 3, 6, 9, about 1,200 miles out north of Hawaii. Aimed well at the islands, not so much at the U.S. West Coast. Tuesday morning, still 21-foot seas aimed at Hawaii, moderating the last little bit of 18-foot seas on Tuesday night, and then that guy is gone. Then we go out into the future, looking Friday, Saturday. We see some seas in the 20, 22-foot range off of Japan, but that's really way too far away from either Hawaii or the U.S. Quest west coast to be of any meaning but some activity trying to make it to the date line a week from now and again the tropical system forecast unbelievable but we'll see this all looks very interesting and seasonally it is appropriate and with the el nino pattern building and the jet way to the south not a bad situation all in all Local wind forecast for California here and Hawaii. High pressure in control, building the usual summertime pressure gradient. 30 knot north winds off of Cape Mendocino. That was Sunday morning generating wind swell. But near shore, ocean, the winds pretty calm, not bad. So not a completely bump mess. So there is bump from this fetch working near shore into north and central California. Trades 15 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. As we get into Monday, more of the same, a light wind regime for California other than uh, Cape Mendocino region, light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Tuesday, more of the same. Now, this is that low developing north of Hawaii. You can see the fetch aimed right at the islands, not really at the U.S. West Coast at all. Light wind regime for California, light trades for the Hawaiian Islands. Get into Wednesday, same deal. Maybe a little bit of wind swell generated by this 30 knot winds off of Cape Mendocino, but otherwise light wind for California and a near calm wind regime for the Hawaiian Islands. Well, Thursday, more of the same. Light winds for California. This will be great 
for helping to build some water temperatures near shore along the coast. I mean, just clear skies, the sun beating down, no wind to create any mixing or upwelling. So that's good. Light winds again for the Hawaiian Islands, not even trades. Friday, calm winds basically for California, calm winds for Hawaii. The La Nina high pressure regime, it appears to be gone. Thank goodness. Saturday, again, light winds both for Hawaii and California. And we can get into Sunday here. Now, this low is not currently forecast. This was, again, the 18-hour-old data, but a light wind regime for California and the Hawaiian Islands. Precipitation-wise for California, pretty dry right now, but over, what was that, Friday or Saturday morning, there was light snow uh, over Mammoth Mountain and also uh, at um, uh, Mount Rose. These are higher mountains in the nine to 10,000 foot range, and, and the snow level was quite high. I mean, there was even a couple of little tiny patches of dusting of snow at the top of Squaw Val or uh, Palisades Tahoe, but it all, even at the higher elevations, pretty much melted uh, during the day yesterday and is gone. But a dusting of early season snow, and I believe that's actually the second one of the season so far. So uh, a little bit of encouragement there. Now we're just going to blast through this because there is literally no precip forecast for California for the coming week. And there you go. Surf forecast for Half Moon Bay. Now, you can't really tell what's going on. You see the wind swell fading out as we get into Monday. Then there's a little bump up here on Tuesday and Wednesday. That is the new swell coming from the Gulf of Alaska and then fading from there. Let's see if we can tease it out. All you get is one little reading here. The wind swell just pretty much dominating. You see the reading here on Tuesday, but there is actually, you know, three feet at 14 seconds and maybe even a little bit more than that. So some surf potential. And then that swell uh, fading out period in the 10 to 11 seconds as we get into Thursday and Friday. Um, so a little bit of swell, nothing too much, but something. Southern California, pretty quiet. This swell coming from the north down south, it'll be a foot or a foot and a half maybe if, if we're lucky. You can see wave sizes in the one and a half foot range sort of thing. Swell size, there you go, one and a half feet at 11 seconds, 12 seconds. Um, and that is about it. See some energy here later on, one foot at 15 seconds coming from the south, background southern hemi energy, maybe, nothing too much though. And then for the north shore of Oahu, so here's the little bump of swell. It's tiny sideband energy from that gale that traversed uh, from the dateline over into the gulf from basically a west to east pattern four foot surf, but then bigger swell potentially from the gale that's to set up north of the Hawaiian Islands as we get into, what was it, uh, Tuesday and uh, Monday and Tuesday sort of thing. That's well on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, current, here we go. Uh, current swell on Monday, three feet at 13 seconds sort of thing, fading out into Tuesday. New swell building up, building in up to five feet at 12 seconds, something like that, uh, providing for rideable surf for Wednesday, Thursday, even into Friday, and then starting to settle down from there. So a little bit of surf for everybody, nothing too much though. All right, let's go take a look long term at the two major oscillations that uh, impact or positively affect the swell production in the Pacific. The MJO, the Batten-Julian Oscillation, and ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. We'll start by looking for signs of the active phase of the Madden-Julian Oscillation. There are two phases, the active phase and the inactive phase. The active phase is like a low-pressure system. The inactive phase like a high-pressure system. They, the two phases travel around the planet from west to east, one on, the, one on one side of the planet, the other on, on the opposite side. They travel west to east around the equator. What we want to see is the active phase of the MJO moving over the West Pacific. Because it's low pressure, 
When that happens, it takes warm, moist air on the equator in the West Pacific, start lifting it aloft. That warm, moist air gets caught by the jet stream. That energizes the jet stream, makes for a stronger jet, which makes for stronger troughs, which makes for stronger storms, and therefore surf. Also, the active phase of the MJO, when in the far west Pacific, we call it the Kelvin Wave Generation Area, when it's over there, it dampens trade winds if it's strong enough. And when you dampen the trade winds, what that does is allow west, um, I mean, warm water that's over in the west Pacific to start seeping east because it doesn't have the trade winds holding it up over in the west Pacific. But it doesn't, it, so it travels west to east, but not on the surface, under the equator, in a thing known as a Kelvin Wave, a ball of warm water that travels subsurface from the far west Pacific to the east Pacific. It takes about four months. Eventually, that ball of warm water, that Kelvin wave, hits the Galapagos Islands and Ecuador, erupts to the surface, creates a warm water slick. If you have successive active phases of the MJO, they can create successive Kelvin waves, like happened earlier this year. We had five Kelvin waves in a row. They've erupted off of Ecuador and create a big warm water slick there. What that does then is start changing the atmosphere above it, and that is the hallmark of El Nino. Warm water building off of Peru and Ecuador. The cloud cover pattern normally confined to the far west Pacific moving east. That drags the jet stream with it, and then we get all the magic in the winter months that El Nino is made for. The opposite of that is also true during La Nina. You get high pressure. It enhances the trades. It uh, dampens any potential for Kelvin wave production, and you end up with not a good surf production season during, uh, or, or mu not good support for surf production or storm production during the inactive phase of the MJO. Now, typically in a normal year or in a normal pattern, you get the active phase for about four to six weeks traversing the Pacific. Then the inactive phase comes in for four to six weeks and back and forth. If you ever noticed when we've had a relatively normal pattern, which we haven't had for a while, you get periods of storms and swells that go for about four weeks, five weeks, then things sort of go quiet for a little while. And in the, then in the winter months again, then all of a sudden it'll wake up again, you get another burst of four or five months or four or five weeks of surf, and then it quiets down again. That is all the active phase doing its magic. So what we're looking for is signs of the active phase of the MJO in the atmosphere today. Okay, because the active phase is the good phase, the one that supports storm development. So we're looking at data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. That's the East Pacific there. This is the West Pacific here. There's the equator. 180 West, that's the date line right there. That's New Guinea right there. We're just looking at, so these buoys are strung along here. They have wind sensors on them. They're not the same kind of wind sensors like our local buoys that give you hourly or 20 minute updates. These are just five day average winds, but that's good enough for what we need. We're just looking at the arrows. We see, well, we see some arrows from the east, mainly all from the east here. So wind's pretty strong out of the east over the east Pacific, pretty strong out of the east over the central Pacific. But in the west Pacific, it's not, we have full on west winds, not strong, but just a little bit of west winds. That's not typical. That's a sign of the active phase of the MJO. But even we dig a little deeper, it's not the actual wind speeds. It's the difference from normal for this time of year that really makes the magic happen. So we look in the East Pacific here, we see some easterly arrows, but we also see this one westerly arrow. I'm wondering whether it may be one of the wind sensors on one of the buoys here is stuck, or is there really sort of a mixed wind pattern going on here? Anyway, we get to the Central Pacific, winds are pretty much neutral. And in the West Pacific, the whole way to the Dateline, the whole Kelvin Wave Generation Area, filled with modest west anomalies. A clear sign of at least the active phase of the MJO. Now, when El Nino gets set up, El Nino effectively acts like a long-running active phase of the MJO. And I think that's really part of what's going on here. We've had consistent westerly anomalies here for weeks and weeks now. It's a sign, again, this goes to the title we talked in the video, El Nino building, right? This is a clear sign of that. All right, let's move on.
Wind anomalies for the past five days. This is the whole planet. The oranges and red westerly anomalies. Think of that like the active phase of the MJO. Blues, inactive phase of the MJO. Easterly anomalies. South America, Central America, New Guinea right there. The equator right there. Dateline right there. Kelvin wave generation area right here. This is where all the magic happens. West anomalies in this area is what you want to see because one, that feeds the jet stream. That's where all the energy gets imparted to the jet stream to feed the storm track. Two, that's also where you get Kelvin wave production. Well, we see west anomalies that were there the 25th of September, the 26th, 27th, 28th, smaller, but still present on the 29th. That all looks pretty good. All right, so what's the forecast for the next two weeks? 850 millibars zonal wind anomalies. So this is actually when the surface is like 925 millibars. You go up a little bit, 4,700 feet. That's where this is, but a pretty good proxy for what's going on at the surface. You know, we're just looking for broad brush stroke, stroke tendencies of what the wind is doing. All right, so the equator runs right, I mean, I'm sorry, the dateline runs right up the middle here. The oranges and reds, westerly anomalies, active phase of the MJO, blues, easterly anomalies. All right, now the far west Pacific starts here at 125 east. This is where New Guinea is. It goes right up there. There's a seam there. And the Kelvin wave generation here goes to about 170 west, so here. So this is what has been happening. You see westerly anomalies started building in mid-September. They've been going pretty much the whole month of September. Yeah, this little finger of easterly anomalies today in the West Kelvin wave, gen but still, westerly anomalies in control, in control into maybe October 10th. Little bit, little pocket of easterly anomalies. The model's been showing this pocket, but every day it keeps getting smaller and smaller, and then westerly anomalies building back in. That all looks good, but you say, well, what's that big giant wall of purple going on here. So this is part of the title of the video. This is key into the coupling of El Nino. We've been talking about the Kelvin waves already, right? Multiple Kelvin waves traversed the Pacific earlier this year, created a big warm water slick, and we'll get into that in the East Pacific. But then it, that has to, well, the changes in the ocean have to then modify the atmosphere above the ocean. Well, what we're seeing is a pattern of building westerly anomalies over the West Pacific. Now, this here, this is over in the Indian Ocean. Strong east anomalies. So, winds blowing from west to east coming to here, and then, I'm sorry, from this way out, I'm sorry, from east to west over the Indian Ocean, and from west to east over the Pacific Ocean. So, what's that mean? What that really suggests Somewhere right along here, there's a wall of air falling down, hitting the ocean, and then, well, let's see, I can do it. Falling down and then splitting, going either direction. That would actually be a sign of, they call it the Indian Ocean Dipole. I'm also in the positive phase. I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole because it's over most people's head, but the bit of the walker circulation and the coupling of the ocean with the atmosphere. We think this is a sign of that, not the work walker circulation per se, but a clear sign of downward falling wind over the uh, Indian Ocean, moving that downward falling wind, hitting the surface, splitting the westward anomalies, building over the West Pacific. Then at some point they need to start lifting up going up into the atmosphere, taking warm moist air and lifting it aloft. That's a key sign of the development of El Nino. We're going to get into that in a minute. But you can already see some clear signals of something very significant going on in the Indian Ocean. Next up, outgoing long wave radiation. All right, cloud cover, basically. But this is cloud cover related to the MJO, not related to some of this other stuff we're talking about. Yeah, the uh, active phase of the MJO is like a low-pressure system. Because it's low-pressure system, it can take warm, moist air, lifting it aloft, creating clouds. If you have clouds, then sunlight can't reflect off the ocean surface. The blue are areas that are cloudier than normal related to the MJO. Oh, and let's get organized or oriented here. South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea there, the equator right there, 
the date line right there. All important Kelvin wave generation area right there. So a weak active phase of the MJ was suggested today. This is per the statistic model, but then you see nothing, nothing, nothing for 5, 10, 15 days out. So no sign of the MJO. But you go, but wait, there's West Anomalies in the West Pacific. What's going on? We think that is, again, a sign of a building El Nino signal in the atmosphere, not related to the MJO, really driven all by El Nino. The uh, other model, the GEFS ensemble model, is a dynamic model, suggests, if anything, and it, a hint of an inactive phase 5 and 10, I'm um, sorry, 10 and 15 days from now, about two weeks out. But again, this model has been all over the place, too. Suspect probably a neutral pattern. Let's dig a little deeper. Next up, phase diagram for the same two models. The uh, 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 statistic model, dynamic model here. What are we looking at? Well, this is a map of where the MJ is moving. It moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent to the West Pacific, to the East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase is right now. So in the eastern maritime continent almost ready to start moving into the west pacific but if the dot is inside the circle it's considered very weak three different flavors of the model run all suggest the active phase moving to about the west pacific two weeks from now but exceedingly weak and not really doing a whole lot the dynamic model basically saying the same thing but putting the active phase maybe over africa but very weak two weeks from now either way if if you're in a normal non-El Nino year, you'd want to see this dot like way up high here in the West Pacific. That'd be a strong crushing active phase of the MJO, sort of like what we had last winter at a couple occasions that produced the Kelvin waves that had produced all the warm water that's building up off of uh, Ecuador as we speak today. But today, none of that appears to be in play, suggesting that the West anomalies that are in the West Pacific right now are not MJO related. They are El Nino related. Good news. Next up, upper level model, suggesting just areas favorable for precipitation. The greens favorable, the oranges dry air. The greens, the active phase, the MJO, the oranges, the inactive phase. All right, so South America, Central America, Hawaii is that dot there, New Guinea there, the equator there, the dateline roughly running right down here. So this looks like areas favorable for precipitation. That'd be the active phase of the MJO hanging out for about through October 6th, maybe even the 11th, and then moving into the East Pacific and out of the picture. Here comes the inactive phase of the MJO. Now, this is what this model says. I'll be honest with you. Every other model isn't saying anything like this, okay? In at, this is a statistic model, though, and not surprised that maybe it's a little bit out of whack. The inactive phase traversing the Kelvin wave generation in area through the end of October, and then as we get into uh, November, active phase again showing up, pretty much ignoring this model. All right, 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies from the CFS model going out one month. Past performance here. This shows the active and inactive phases of the MJO. The solid black contour is the active phase of the MJO. And you can see the reds are westerly anomalies, the blues easterly anomalies. You can see an active phase of the MJO pushing across. Oh, let's get ourselves oriented here before I get into, j j jump right to the details. Dateline right here. Far West Pacific starting about 125 East, so right here. So the Kelvin wave generation area in the pretty much in between this line and this line going the whole way down the chart. So active phase of the MJ, actually here was an inactive phase back in the early part of July, then the active phase late July through August traversing the Pacific, creating westerly anomalies along with it. Then we had that was the sole extent of our inactive phase of the MJO, the beginning of September. And here you go, starting about September, what was that, the 9th, westerly anomalies started building, building, building. Here we are today. There continue. The forecast for the next month, westerly anomalies fully in control. There's some sort of spurious uh a active or inactive MJO signals here. I bet you the next run of the model, they're all gone. This really smells like a El Nino base state taking over. And why do I say that? Well, here's again that big old mass of easterly anomalies right here. Sinking air more than likely 
hitting somewhere between these two. So this would be in the far west Indian Ocean. Uh, this is the maritime con the, the beginning of the Pacific Ocean right here. So somewhere in the East Indian Ocean, sinking air hitting, splitting, going to the uh, creating easterly anomalies over the West Indian Ocean and West anomalies over the West Pacific. Classic El Nino kind of signal. And the purple here, low pressure bias. Again, the El Nino signal. And the dotted contour, high pressure bias. Classic. Again, this is feeding the Indian Ocean dipole. But I also believe this is part, it's either part of a change in the Walker circulation or at a minimum and its own circulation unto itself that will be feeding El Nino. I kind of hard to think that the Indian Ocean Dipole can live all by itself in the absence of El Nino and the MJO and all that, though it probably does it. And, you know, I am no Indian Ocean Dipole expert, but this very much smells like the development of El Nino. And then the same model, we go looking in the upper atmosphere, outgoing long wave radiation, cloud cover again. What's it say? What's it say is going on? Well, you can see this building, the greens are cloudier. I think they're negative anomalies, right? Yeah. Less sunlight reflecting off the ocean surface. So cloud cover building starting September, I don't know, 5th or something like that. You can actually see it starting in pockets here and then getting stronger. Here we are, pretty strong uh, cloud cover pattern over mm, somewhere near around the date line and continuing on for the next month. And then the same deal here, where those easterly anomalies are, dry, bone dry air, no chance for precipitation. So the equivalent of a La Nina setting up over the Indian Ocean and maritime continent, while the wet pattern builds over the Pacific. The exact opposite of what we've had the previous two to three years. So again, all suggestive of El Nino. Wind anomaly forecast from the CFS model for weeks one and two. Uh, so that's uh, the 1st of October through the 7th. Oh, and it's kind of hard to see it here, but South America, Central America, that's the equator, that's the dateline. Kelvin wave generation area right in here. The, you can see the oranges, westerly anomalies, classic at a minimum uh, active phase of the MJO. Now notice these westerly anomalies pushing almost the whole way to Ecuador. That's this coming week. The week after that, October 8th through the 14th, the entire Pacific covered with westerly anomalies. Then we go out three weeks from now, again, westerly anomalies filling the entire Pacific. And then by as we get to the end of October, westerly anomalies, again, still covering most of the Pacific, but focused more now in the West Pacific. Very a very, very good pattern indicated here. This sh theoretically should mean lots of potential for storm, uh, jet stream enhancement, and storm and swell development for the month of October. So if we don't believe a model four days out, why would we look a month out? And if I don't believe a model a month out, why would I look at a model out three months? And that's what we're, exactly what we're doing because, well, one, it's fun, and two, it gives us at least some clues of what's coming for the future. All right, so this is the CFS model. This is outgoing long wave radiation again. Cloud cover high up in the atmosphere, up at like jet stream level uh, about. All right, past is down here. The forecast is up here. The date line running right here. Kelvin wave generation area, West Pacific starts about 125 east. So this is the main area here. In the past, you see this building spotty blues, increased clouds building over the date line, while you see this solid building dry air cloud free pattern building over the Indian Ocean and the, I'll call it the Western Maritime Continent. Here we are today. And from here on forward, you can just see a steadily building cloud pattern forecast right on the date line. That would be the upward flow of the Walker circulation. In fact, I got a chart here. Let's take a look real quick. El Nino conditions. And let's get ourselves oriented. South America, Central America, and the U.S. proper. There's the equator. We're looking up in the atmosphere from zero up to, let's say, 30,000 feet. There's Australia, the maritime continent right there. 
During El Nino, you get sinking air, this downward thing. And what we've been seeing in all the evidence that I've been showing you so far and all the forecasts, downward flowing circulation. But it seems to be more over in the 120 area. In fact, let me go take a look. You've got some notes here. Might even be over as far as 80. So it's more like over here. And the upward circulation, so this is peak El Nino. This would be like at 150 south of Hawaii sort of thing. This is actually more centered right here, right on the dateline. The upward flowing air, warm moist air as it hits cold air aloft creates clouds. Okay, and you get that uh, negative outgoing long wave radiation. Sinking air is dry air. It hits the land. It makes cloud-free skies, drought, and baking conditions, and you get po uh, you get what do you get? Positive outgoing long wave radiation. Lots of sunlight bouncing off the ocean surface. So this is the Walker circulation. We believe we are seeing lots of evidence of it starting to move into a somewhat El Nino configuration. So here we go. The evidence, well, the building cloud pattern, but it is over the date line. It's not like over 150 west. And as El Nino matures, theoretically, these clouds start moving off to the east, driven by westerly anomalies, driven by the deepening of the Walker circulation. It moves deeper into the Pacific. Now, whether that's going to happen is certainly up for debate, but let's just, you know, Yes, if we wanted a super El Nino, we'd see this cloud pattern. It'd be sitting right over top of California in December. It'd be just a blowing mess and, you know, piles of rain. That's all good stuff. Probably snow up high, but surf-wise, it'd just be a blown-out mess north of Point Conception. This suggests building clouds and heavily, but pretty much locked somewhere. Well, let's see, maybe moving off. So right here, we're at, what is that? That's about 150 west in December, but for now, just right on the dateline. And the other clear signal here, this building dry air pattern associated with positive phase in the ocean dipole, but again, we think because there's all this wet air building over the Pacific, it's as much a partner sign of the development of El Nino, of anything, and it just getting solid, 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 then fading out some as we get in December as El Nino is peaking over the Pacific. All right, that was up at like jet stream level or maybe a little bit below there. Now let's go down at the surface. The same pattern, look at this. So you see, here's the date line here. The yellows are westerly anomalies. Westerly anomalies steadily, slowly building over the date line region while easterly anomalies, the dry air pattern, building over the Indian Ocean. From today on, it's just building westerly anomalies. I mean, this is this is a serious westerly no anomaly event here starting a week from now. It's actually starting even right now. Last week, I think we talked about it like today should be the day it starts. And we're seeing clear signs of that. But it's not really till mid-October till things really get going. And then once it gets going, the whole way through December, solid westerly anomalies. You can see the Indian Ocean Dipole event, strong easterly anomalies just building just, you know, this would be full-on drought conditions for Australia and the Indian Ocean if this all plays out. We expect that it will. We're going to overlay the MJO here. Oops, actually, that was one member. This is the average, maybe not quite as strong. In fact, let's play this game. There is one member, I think that's the 0Z run of the model, the 6Z run of the model, the 12Z run of the oh, wow, that's impressive, 12Z run, 18Z run, average them all together, you get this kind of thing. Uh, either way, pretty impressive. Let's overlay the average MJO. Here we go, Act the solid contour, active phase of the MJO. Oh, maybe we can, let's see if we can do this here. Oh, I can't easily, oh, there we go. There's the date line right there. Active phase of the MJO, pretty much starting to build into the Kelvin wave generation area. Should be fully there. Give it oh, a week. Okay. And then you that's what's what they call it, constructively interfering with the El Nino base state. El Nino is westerly anomalies. You throw an active MJO on top of that, it doubles down on the westerly anomalies, and then you get this, boom, a westerly wind burst event. Maybe it'll create another Kelvin wave. Who knows? That would be impressive if it did. Okay, then we get into, oh, November. Inactive phase of the MJO sets up, but notice, 
westerly anomalies continue even through December, and it'll probably go long past that if we're in an El Nino state. Easterly anomalies, rock solid today over the Indian Ocean, continuing even getting more entrenched as we get into fall, you know, the October, November, even December time frame. That's typically the peak of El Nino is like November, December, at least from an atmospheric signal. Uh, but in terms of then you pair it up with the building of winter and it just sends winter over the top in January, February, March, April tend to be, you know, pretty, pretty solid swell producing uh, months during El Nino. This El Nino, a little bit slow in getting started, but we think we're in a much better place. I mean, I'm actually optimistic. Of all the videos we've done for months now, and the standard running joke is, yeah, it's like watching paint dry. Well, I think our paint is dry. I think the colors look pretty good. I think the room is getting set up, maybe not optimal, you know, not super El Nino, but getting set up really nicely. All right, finally, low-pass filter, high-low-pressure bias. Wow, this is impressive, too. One, two, three. So the solid contour is the low-pressure bias. It's the El Nino signal, okay? The dotted contour, let's start there. This is the high-pressure bias. This is the La Nina signal that was over California. 120 West is California. Over California and only died officially last week. I think the day before last week's video, it was officially dead over California. Now, notice this. Boom. A week later, here it shows up in the Indian Ocean and builds one, two contours. High pressure bias taking over. And last winter, it was high pressure over the Pacific Ocean. Here is the low pressure bias with one, two, three contours. And this is even better. A fourth contour building November 2nd actually is sooner than what it was a couple of weeks ago. And now a fifth contour, which is forecast for maybe the first week of December, solid. And now notice the tilt of this. We were talking about where is the upflow of that walker circulation going to be. The further to the east it is, the greater the potential for weather impacts into California. Uh, Super El Ninos, the 97 El Nino, and I want to say thanks to Ben. Uh, if you if you all are watching the comments section, uh, Ben and myself get into these long rambling dis discussions about the ultimate finite details of El Ninos and the climatology of El Ninos, the 97, the 2015, even the 82. And he's he's got a wealth of information he's been digging up. So during the 97 El Nino, the center of the... Uh, of the Walker circulation. I think I saw in one of the charts it basically moved right over top of California in like March. But if you remember 97 in March, it was just a rainy, blown out, horribly ugly mess. Yes, lots of great weather, but kind of miserable to have to live through. So this shows in December the center of the Walker circulation at, we'll just eyeball it here, 170 West. And we, I'm betting in, you know, January, February, it'll maybe make it to 150 West, so north of Hawaii. That'd put the center of the low pressure bias, we'll say somewhere north of Hawaii. That would be where the center of all the storm production would be. And could, could mean pretty stormy conditions for Hawaii. Certainly, you know, the storm, that's the center of genesis of storms, uh, that doesn't mean that they just stop there. No, lots of storms will push into the Gulf of Alaska, create piles of surf, but there might be just a smidgen of enough weakness over California uh, north of Point Conception to maybe not make it be a complete blown out mess. We'll see. So that's still up for debate. Anyway, you can see low pressure bias here, high pressure bias today, starting over the Indian Ocean, building uh, east wind anomalies there. It's pretty much looks like classic, maybe not super El Nino, but classic solid El Nino. And just one more little piece of data, actual outgoing long wave radiation. This isn't forecast modeled stuff. This is the real deal. Dateline running right up the middle. The oranges and reds dry air. So last year at this time, you can see it here, dry, dry air, La Nina signal, all the wet air. The rising, uh, the negative outgoing long wave radiation, all of it at 120 east in the Indian Ocean or over the maritime continent. And then we got to about the middle of April and all of a sudden the dry air collapsed. 
And so in the wet air, you can see pieces of it. It was all aligned here, starting to drift over to the date line. We got a pretty nice pulse here in July. Backed off. It stalled a little in August. Now here we are building again. And notice the dry air pattern, which was over the date line, now building over the Indian Ocean. Now, not as solid, but this was a three-year, you know, we were into three years of La Nina at this point here. So we are clearly moving towards an El Nino-like configuration. Maybe not as strong as we like, but you saw the models. Give it about two or three months. I think the signal is going to end up looking like this, but reversed with all the goodness over the Pacific and all the badness over the Indian Ocean. All right, what's going on in the ocean, down in the ocean, down at depth? So these, this is data from the TAA buoy array, that series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. This is the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific here. These are the actual, these axes, these are, these are sensors on the anchor chain that's anchoring the buoy down in the middle of the Pacific, down thousands of feet. And they put sensors on the top uh, two or 300 meters of these. You can take this data, you marry it up with a model, and you get a profile of what subsurface ocean temperatures are doing. So we have the 30-degree isotherm. This is 30 degrees centigrade. It's actually backtracking a little. It was at 170 last week, back about 2 degrees. 29-degree isotherm, same thing. It was at 155. It's backtracked about 2 degrees. 28-degree isotherm, it was at 140. It's about still at 140. That all said, the really good news here is the 24-degree isotherm, at one point it at its deepest, it was 50, almost 60 meters deep. Then a couple of weeks ago, it rose up to maybe 25 meters deep. Last week was at 37. Now it looks like about 40 meters deep. So this suggests that warm water is moderately building in the East Pacific again. Kelvin waves, you know, they take four months to make it their way across the Pacific. And then if you have easterly anomalies, which we've had over the East Pacific, they kind of dampen the Kelvin wave production a little bit, or at least the signal of it. But it looks like warm water is building again in the East Pacific. In fact, let's look at anomalies. Difference from normal for this time of year. And you can pl plainly see it here. The East Pacific here, West Pacific here, three, four, five degree above normal subsurface water temperatures, that's Fahrenheit. I mean, that's centigrade, so that's probably, I don't know, nine degrees centigrade, something like that. Lot of very warm water. And as that warm water lifts up, it gets even warmer still. It looks like, when you can see, three degree anomalies going down 50, 75 uh, meters down in the ocean. All right, so the results, this is probably the, the, the results of Kelvin waves four and five right here, all back filling in. And then another Kelvin wave, Kelvin wave number six from the last active phase of the MJO that was in July, I think, or early August, something like that. Still lingering out here, back filling in. The machine is doing well. And consider, we just looked at the models. Way more westerly anomalies are building. A giant westerly wind burst is forecast here in the coming uh, month. That will only take more warm water, suck it out of the maritime continent, spill it into the Pacific, and it will start its trek across the Pacific. Have we talked about any bad news at all in this video? I think the answer is no. Things are definitely looking up. The GODAS uh, data, uh, this is satellite-based, same sort of picture, but it does it using different technology, suggests, hey, here we go, we'll just do it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, five degree anomalies here, and four degree anomalies here, a nice batch of probably two Kelvin waves overlaying each other, building into the East Pacific, warm water at one, two, three, one to one to two degrees above normal over this entire area. Notice the stream thin and weak, but still a stream of warm water backfilling into the reservoir, mega reservoir of warm water in the East Pacific, and nary a sign of any significant cool water. All this looks like El Nino. 
Pentad sea level anomalies, September 25th. Finally, it's been updated. No, uh, so the site was down. The data was updating all along, but it's kind of all hidden behind a wall. So you get what you get when you're when you're not paying for it. Uh, the equator right here, Dateline right here, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Central America, Hawaii there, New Guinea there. These are sea heights. You take a satellite. It's bounce. It's rotating polar orbit for over the north and south poles. The Earth spins underneath that as it just sits there and does the same loop. Over the period of a week, it maps out every square inch of the ocean's surface. This is measuring the height of the sphere of the ocean, deviation from normal. Take out the waves, wind waves, the tide. Is the sphere of the ocean higher than normal or lower than normal? Why do you care? Well, higher than normal and on just a couple centimeters suggests, well, warm water at depth, it expands, it'll create a, it dis displaces water on the ocean surface, creates a bump, and you end up with this positive anomaly pool, suggesting warm water off of Ecuador the whole way out to the dateline and even below. Uh, likewise, colder than normal water contracts, you get a divot on the ocean surface. You can see a bit of that right here, but it's only five degrees north and south of the equator that really matter. So yeah, my guess is there's some sort of east wind anomaly event that's been going on here, the last lingering stages of perhaps uh, La Nina in the atmosphere, that high pressure bias we saw giving up the ghost. My guess is in a week or two, this is all going to disappear. Sea surface temperature anomalies. All right. Classic El Nino sign, warmer than, oh, let's go Chile, Peru, Central America right here, Hawaii out here, the equator right here. Uh, sea surface temperature anomalies, differences in normal for this time of year. Temperatures much warmer than normal off of Ecuador. This is classic El Nino sign, multiple Kelvin waves erupting in this area, leaching to the surface or erupting to the surface, creating a warm water slick. That warm water gets caught by the trades. You can see it get dragged off here to the east. Now, the warmest pocket right there, the the... It's really warm here, but we want to see the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 1.2 region goes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the 3.4 region. Well, let's talk about it. Nino 1.2 is roughly here. Don't ask me where the names come from, how, you know, but they just label 1.2 here. 3 is somewhere over here. 4 is out to here, but the hybrid one, sort of the gold standard, is the Nino 3.4 region. It goes from 120 west, 5 degrees north and south of the equator, out to 170 west right here. So you see lots of super warm water in Nino 1.2 getting caught by the trades, getting dragged into the Nino 3.4 region. But the last little pocket of semi-warm water only makes it to 145 west. It was out at 158 at one point, suggesting there's been some... Well, we, we've been going through the inactive phase of the MJO, right? We've had west anomalies over in the West Pacific pretty much the whole time, even during the inactive phase. But it's having, it's increasing trades over in this region. That creates some upwelling. I think it's actually been dampening the warm water signal that is been in this area and making it look not as warm as it is, even though there's piles of warm water at depth. With the active phase setting up, or at least the building of El Nino and the development of Westerly and Almis theoretically building over the entire um, uh, Pacific per the CFS model over the coming weeks, I'm thinking you're going to see temperatures over here really start jumping. Give it about a week or two, and we're going to see something perhaps pretty cool, a clear, clear sign of warming El Nino waters. Sea surface temperature trend the past seven days. Well, you can see the blue here. Um, this is Ecuador right here. A little bit of cooling here. Again, that east anomaly pattern that we've been talking about, it's been in play for like a month. We think that, I think that's all related to the inactive phase of the MJO. This will all disappear and you're going to see warming start building in this area, uh, maybe as early as next week. And then the overview again, the clear El Nino pattern right there. You can't miss it. Warmer waters along Ecuador and Peru up into Central America, the whole way out to the dateline. Here's that last little pocket of La Nina, uh, easterly anomalies. I think this is also responsible for those negative anomalies that we saw in the satellite data right here. Um, but that really is of no concern. It's five degrees north and south of the equator that matter. And for, for right now, it looks good. We want to see this build stronger, though. 
Sea surface temperature trend in the Nino 1.2 region. The air right there by uh, Ecuador and the Galapagos. Temperatures, you can see it. They've been peaking out. They peaked out throughout the early part of September. They've been drifting down today. Only at plus 1.876, where we were up at plus 3 degrees at one point. Again, I think a lot of this is easterly anomalies, the inactive phase of the MJO. I'm expecting this to start heading up, especially with that giant ball of warm water subsurface. Give it about two weeks. We should be back in business there. The official El Nino monitoring region also taking a little bit of a hit. Temperatures plus 1.129, 1 degree and 129 thousandths a degree above normal. We are up at about 1.28 uh, degrees for, well, August and most of September. Again, I think this is the inactive phase sort of, you know, t buffeting it a little bit. Um, let's go look at something else here. The weekly OISST uh, version 2 uh, sea surface temperature trend in the Nino 3.4, the official El Nino monitoring region, right here. The last week, 1.7 degrees. You can see it's steadily working its way up. We might take a, a little bit of a hit this week because of those easterly anomalies drop down to 1.5 or something like that. But then I think we're going to head back up from there. Also in the Nino 1.2 region, you see temperatures were up at plus 3.4 in the early August, 3.3 mid-August, and you see they've taken a hit as well. All this, I think, attributable to the inactive phase of the MJO, but we'll just have to wait and see. Just for comparison's sake, so here is this year's El Nino sea surface temperature anomaly trend. We can go back and look at 2015 just for comparison. Maybe I can drop down here so we can make that a little bit more direct. So actually, just look eyeballing the surface data this year. Almost looks comparable. I'd say there's a little bit more warmth out here in 2015 than this year. You can see it is focused more up along Ecuador. It hasn't built out this far. Uh, that speaks to one this this st the stalling of the MJO and the El Nino in the late August, early September time frame. Uh, I think we're getting close to being over that hump now. If not, we are completely over it. But now let's compare to 97. There is literally no comparison. This was the gold standard of El Nino's. We are not anywhere near that, nor do we expect that we will be there. But still, nice to look at history to see where you're at. We're certainly not in La Nina. So continuing on the theme, is El Nino copper, is the ocean, the El Nino ocean signal, coupled with the atmosphere. Again, we've been in three years of La Nina, that, and it's quite an effort to try to turn the whole planet's ocean around, change all these upper air currents around uh, when you've been dug in with three years of momentum to La Nina. But we think that is happening. We're looking at the Southern Oscillation Index, dif difference in pressure between Tahiti, right there, and Darwin. Uh, when pressure is lower in Tahiti, meaning lower pressure over the Pacific, higher pressure over Darwin, the index goes negative, minus 5.03. Okay, it's not that negative. And it's sort of been waffling around there for the past one, two, three, and eh, past week, something like that. Now, notice we were much deeper in September, uh, in later September and the whole way through. Again, I think a lot of this speaks to the inactive phase of the MJO that is fading now. And I think in the next couple of days, you're going to see these numbers starting to go more negative. The 13 day average, this is sort of your active inactive phase of the MJO indicator, minus 13.3. Not bad. You know, minus 15 is good. Minus 25 is where you'd want to be at the peak of El Nino. We've not been anywhere close to that, but we are definitely, you can see we were at minus 15, minus 15.7. We've lost a little ground. Again, that speaks to the inactive phase of the MJ. We're probably going to lose ground here for another week, and then things, I think, are going to start going negative. The 90-day average, minus 10.02. This is your El Nino, La Nina indicator. Clearly not La Nina, not strong El Nino. This needs to be down at minus 15. Where have we been? Well, minus 5 to minus 10. That's pretty good. 
We're only five away from being in pretty solid El Nino territory. I think we're doing all right here. In fact, let's go look at this data graphed out. Southern Oscillation Index, 30-day average graphed out. Okay, there's the zero line. If you're above the line, you're in uh, La Nina territory. If you're, you're below the line, you're in El Nino territory. Now, let's be clear. You have to be above the line for multiple months in a row to be in La Nina territory and likewise to be in El Nino territory. The downward spikes here are the active phase of the MJO. The upward spikes are the inactive phase. So we, we were doing really great there in spring. It looked like we were going into a super El Nino. Then here we go. We hit the hiccup in late June. July was just a mess. August was a bit of a mess, but improving. And here we are. There is your inactive phase of the MJO that we are just about out of. I expect any day now this is going to start turning and start falling down and we're going to end up at least down at if minus 20 or minus 25 as we get into november and december at the peak of el nino so for now though considering we're in the inactive phase of the mjo and we're down here at like minus 15 that's really a great place to be way better than the past three years uh we're basically just and the uh this clearly suggests too that el nino is coupling with the atmosphere we just need a little bit more push to really make the magic starting to happen but by all accounts the models say we're nearly there all right the final uh sort of analysis here ocean currents all right South America right there, Ecuador, um, the Galapagos Islands. You see current going to the east, all right? But then you go to the West Pacific. You see current going from west to east, driven by westerly anomalies, right? And going, making it to a certain point. Now, remember, we've talked about easterly anomalies in the East Pacific and the effects on the sea surface temperatures there and the inactive phase of the MJO and all that kind of stuff. And then you get to this point, we were talking about the Walker circulation. Where is the upflow of the Walker circulation? Because one, you got to be able, to, there has to be an upflow if you're going to have an El Nino. And then the further east that upflow is, the more the closer to the, I'd say the, I, the way I'll call it is the closer the storm generation engine is to the Gulf of Alaska. So we eyeball this thing here. We go, well, the, the juncture point between the west and the east, I'll say, is somewhere like right around there, which is right on the dateline. Okay. Now, again, thanks to Ben, let's see if we can do this. There is another way to look at this. You put your dot there. That is right on the dateline. We're going to add sea surface temperatures onto this. And you see this convec convergence of warm water coming this way, warm water coming off the... Mar oh, maybe we can even put it here. There is the maritime continent over here, and it all flowing out north of New Guinea. And then you see, this is just, this is not sea surface temperature anomalies. This is actual sea surface temperature. So eyeballing the current, here's the, the uh, sort of the juncture point. If you look here, you go, well, maybe it's actually here, which is 174 east. And this sort of suggests wherever you have this warmest water is where you have the most opportunity for evapor evaporation and lifting air. And then we looked at all the other charts outgoing long wave radiation, east anomalies, west anomalies. They all suggest the updraft of the Walker circulation is somewhere here, maybe not even to the dateline yet, maybe five degrees uh, west of the dateline, but right in here. Um, and then let's do one other thing. So in 2015, we're looking at the exact same thing it looks like at this, uh, this is actually, what, September 30th, the conjunct, the con, the uprise point, the center of the Walker circulation in the 2015 El Nino was maybe there instead of over here. So that's 175 east versus 175 west. So a little bit more off to the east 
than our El Nino right now. Suggesting again, and looking at the sea surface temperature anomalies, that one seems a little bit warmer than this current El Nino. The stall the past month or six weeks, whenever that was in August, really hurt us. And, and pretty much guarantees we're not going to move into super El Nino status. But the question is, where are we going to go from here? How far east is this warm point going to get in our current El Nino, which is right somewhere around there? And how far east is it going to move? Is it going to make it over to here? I mean, the model suggests, suggests uh, the CFS model suggests somewhere around 150, which is oh, right around there. All right. So let's go look at 2015 as a guide. And we'll go, we'll go look in like January and February. Good guess. 150 west in January 15th in the 2015 El Nino. And let's go to the middle of February. So you can see here it actually started backtracking. So the peak, and let's see if we can just do this real time. January 15th, 2016, there was your peak somewhere right around there at 150. And that was a pretty good surf year. It wasn't insanely off the charts, but it was solid. Um, but we can use that as a guide for what might happen in this El Nino, somewhere in that category. Raw data from the CFS model, sea surface temperature anomalies in the Nino 3.4 region. All right, there is our peak at about 1.55. Supposedly temperatures falling to 1.3 or 1.35 degrees above normal in October, in the middle of October, and then building to about 1.7 degrees. Now, the 2015 El Nino was up around 2 or 2.1. That was a super El Nino. So this suggests this one being even weaker. The PDF corrected suggests even lower at 1.5 degrees. My guess is we'll be somewhere maybe in between the two, 1.6 degrees above normal. So El Nino starts half a degree above normal. Weak El Nino goes to one degree. Moderate El Nino goes to one and a half degrees. Strong El Nino goes up to two degrees. This puts it right squarely in the middle of strong El Nino, and then super El Nino is two degrees and above. We don't think there's any chance that that's going to happen. All right, so let's start wrapping this up. Developments. Clouds building. Negative OLR near the dateline. Has been since 624. That pattern continues today. Equatorial current suggests the Walker circulation stronger effects at the surface. Yeah, definitely stronger than last week. Clearer signs, especially with that Indian Ocean dipole and east anomalies building clearly over the Indian Ocean. Things looking good. Then the North Pacific jet stream is improving. Some of that's seasonal. Some of it might be enhanced by El Nino. The SOI is building negative in duration. We want to see it build negative in strength, too. We expect that to start happening as soon as this inactive phase of the MJO clears out, which is happening literally as we speak. Active phase building today, and by next week, we should be in a much better place. West wind anomalies have been holding over the Kelvin wave generation area since July 15th, and are only forecast to get much, much stronger as we get deep into October. Kelvin wave number six continues building and pushing to the east, backfilling into the existing uh, warm pool in the East Pacific, supported by Kelvin waves four and five, and who knows how many others before that. And so models all suggest more of the same moving forward. The CVS, the CFS version two is even on the weaker side. Most dynamic models suggest some sort of an El Nino nearly at two degrees above normal. That's uh, That would be... Uh, Pretty warm, that's bordering on super El Nino status. And we have the active phase of the MJO number seven developing as we speak. Great news. The unknowns, Walker circulation. Is it slowly building towards El Nino? I think at this point in time, we can stick a fork in and say, yes, it is. The real question is, will, will it build strong enough soon enough to really give, her a, give us maximum impacts during January, February, March? Still a little bit of debate there, but I think we're moving in the right direction. West wind anomaly pattern, of course, is to continue over the Kelvin wave generation area and only get stronger. One more Kelvin wave number six is expected. Actually, the active phase of the MJO that's occurring right now, maybe it'll give us Kelvin wave number seven. Who knows? And that could be the wild card in all of this. This pushes us to a very late developing, but maybe more than a, just a strong El Nino, but I'm not going to say the words. Is the ocean and atmosphere coupled? They are. They're getting there. 
they need to be a lot more coupled, but clearly all the data now suggests the paint is dry and we're moving in the right direction. Will the warm pool in the east discharge before coupling occurs? Not even a chance of that, I'd say now. We're in great shape. Is the And of course, is the mod model guidance believable? I'd say it's higher than this 80%. We're probably up in the 90% range, but I'm not going to jinx it. All right, wrapping it all up real quick. Yes, there is little swell coming towards California, mainly north of Point Conception, and small is the operative word. Another gale forecast north of Hawaii going to deliver them a bout of swell, and the models all suggest some sort of sort of a low, a week out developing on the Dateline and pushing to the east. Jet stream looking good, slightly enhanced by developing El Nino. It seems like we are over the hump and moving in the right direction now. And if you believe the models, El Nino and the signals of it and its coupling in the atmosphere is only going to be enhanced as we start moving into the month of October. Late October, some serious magic should start happening with outgoing long wave radiation building strongly over the dateline. Uh, westerly anomalies, major west westerly wind burst forecast for late October into early November, possibly generating another Kelvin wave, but even more importantly, feeding massive amounts of energy into the jet stream, which should just really light up the swell machine as we get towards the Halloween time frame. So something to keep your eyes on. We're not there yet. It's all forecast. But right now, things the model seems to be tracking reasonably well to what's going on finally. And I think we're over the hump. This is great news. Uh, so that is kind of it. We're going to do the video next week. If you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. And click the Storm Surf icon down on the lower right-hand corner. If you want to donate some money, you can. Use the special thanks button down below. If you have questions, then there is lots of weird and heavy technical stuff in this video. Write it up in the comments section. We'll be happy to reply, and there'll probably be a couple other people that'll pile on, and, you know, you'll get a couple of different opinions, all of them good, all of them respectful, and all of them very informative. So thank you all for contributing to this educational forum and helping get all of us up to speed on how our planet and the weather of our planet affects us, and especially our surfing and skiing. All right, that's it for this week. We'll do it again next week, same time, same channel. Thanks for watching.